If I spend too much time speaking to you today, you won't listen to my tapes. <laughs> CDs. The Lord is so good. Look at that. I t he's so good. I just flipped my Bible open to right where I need to go. Isn't that amazing? This must be a mint story this afternoon. Well, almost. One page. <clears throat> well, you folks are spoiling me with these dinners and with your friendship and your love. Let's have an added word of prayer before I start scripture. Father in heaven, again, I ask that you guide my mouth and our ears as we take a few moments this afternoon and consider this most important issue. We pray in Jesus' precious name. Amen. <coughs> Colossians, the third chapter. I'm going to read the first 10 verses. <clears throat> if ye then be risen with Christ, seek those things which are above, where Christ sits on the right hand of God. Set your affection on things above, not on things on the earth. For you are dead, and your life is hid with Christ in God. If you want to understand a little bit more about that death, you can look at Romans chapter 6. Then verse 4, When Christ, who is our life, shall appear, then shall you also appear with him in glory. Mortify, therefore, your members, which are upon the earth, fornication, uncleanness, inordinate affection, evil concupiscence, and covetousness, which is idolatry. For these things sake, the wrath of God cometh on the children of disobedience, in the which you also walked some time, when you lived in them. He really puts it where it hurts, doesn't he? Verse 8. <clears throat> but now you also put off all these. Now you've put all of these things off. Anger, wrath, malice, blasphemy, filthy communications out of your mouth. Oh my. Anybody here would like to admit that they had filthy communications out of their mouth in the past? Not today though, right? Lie not to one another, seeing that you have put off the old man with his deeds, and have put on the new man, which is renewed in knowledge after the image of him that created him. Well, with that reading, I'd like to share a story. <clears throat> a story about Michael. Michael was a stuntman. Do you know what a stuntman is? They're a double. You, you, you have a lot of stuntmen in Hollywood. Um, the filmmakers would like to make you believe that the star of the show would be doing all of these things, like jumping from a train or, a, or um, from a tall building or off a horse that's running fast or... When in reality, it's not the star at all. It's a double. It's a stuntman who's performing the death-defying act. It's not the star actor at all. They would li like to lead you to believe that. Now, Michael, he had carved out quite a career in his TV movie industry. He was never without work. He was doing quite well. 
Now, most all stuntmen have a, uh, what they call their signature stunt, the stunt for which they are best known. They have a stunt man for jumping from a building or a stunt man from jumping from a plane or, or a, uh, a horse or whatever. Well, for Michael, his signature stunt was also well known. He had perfected the ability to, to jump from a, a hovering helicopter onto a moving train. He could drop successfully on top of a moving train car. And whenever a stunt required that particular part of a movie or TV to have a stuntman such as that, Michael was usually the one that they would, uh, that they would call. Well, one day, Michael went out to the movie site. He, he went out to check out the, uh, the top of the rail car upon which he was to be scheduled to jump from the helicopter. He was preparing for an upcoming film that he'd been asked to, to perform. So when he got to the, to the, uh, to the rail yard, he, he got to the car and he climbed up the ladder to the top of the train car and he walked back and forth across the train car observing every little inch of that car. He wanted to know everything about it. He wanted to know the, 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 um, the, the, what kind of um, surface it had and what kind of uh, handholds might be available or whatever on top of that train car. He practiced how he would, uh, would land when he dropped down and he, he tried to determine what it is he would grab hold of when he would drop from the helicopter while the, plane, uh, the train was moving. Well, after he did that for a little while, he became satisfied that he could do the stunt successfully. And he was ready for the shoot. So he turned around and started walking back to the end of the train car and started down the ladder. But two-thirds of the way down the ladder, his foot slipped. And he fell backwards, hitting the back of his head on the heavy steel coupling of the train car, and it caused a severe head trauma. So he was immediately, of course, airlifted to, to the head trauma unit of a local hospital. And they rushed him in and uh, feverishly working on him, trying to, to do all that they could, could possibly do to, to affect his recovery. But sad to say, Michael lost the battle and at 38 years of age, he lost his life. Now, Michael had signed a donor card. He signed this card that in the event of his death, they would donate certain organs. He would donate certain organs, one being his heart. And this was Michael's desire. So with that part of the story behind us, let's shift gears here a moment and let's go to another scene. Many miles away in another hospital, we meet Bob. Bob was 55. He had led a, a terrible, disastrous lifestyle, far from the eight natural remedies. He smoked four packs of cigarettes a day and how you could do that, I don't have it. I, I can't imagine. You must light one with the other all day is the only thing I can figure. Four packs of cigarettes a day. He drank copious amounts of alcoholic beverages. He ate whatever, and whatever was in front of him, whatever he wanted, and that all day long. And he grossly um, abused his life in many other ways. And as a result of this atrocious abuse of his body, his heart gave out. He had spent the last 18 years of his life living, 18 months of his life rather, living in a hospital room, if, if you can call that living. He was hooked up to a machine that worked his heart and kept him alive. Bob had given up all hope. 
Well, one morning he was in his bedroom, in his bed, in, in the room, and he all of a sudden was startled when uh, a lot of noise and commotion was going on, and there were doctors and nurses and other staff flooding into his room. And they began frantically preparing him for surgery. In all the commotion, he didn't know what was going on, and he finally asked, uh, what's happening? A heart, a heart, they were saying. A heart is being flown in as we speak. We must move quickly. Well, they got Bob on the gurney and rushed him down the hallway into surgery. And they went through the meticulous process of removing his heart and placing the donor's heart into his chest. They did all the plumbing. And after a while, the blood started pumping through his veins. And soon, after some rehab, Bob was released from the hospital and he returned home a new man. Now, an amazing and wonderful thing happened to Bob. He realized that he had been granted a new life. And he started looking for help. He wanted to live a healthy lifestyle. So he attended a New Start seminar. And his entire life changed for the better. He never smoked again, never imbibed with alcohol again, he even became a, became a vegan. He was eating healthy. He started a walking program, then a running program. He even ran a few marathons. Bob was enjoying a completely different lifestyle. He had a new heart and a new life. Beloved, our loving Heavenly Father desires to accomplish this surgery, this surgery within the chest of every one of us, his wayward children. Come with me to Ezekiel 36. Ezekiel 36. Many of our, stone, our hearts are of stone. Many of our hearts are of stone. And these hearts have been hardened by the ways of the world. He wants to give us a new heart of flesh. In Ezekiel 36, 26, what does it say there? A new heart also will I give you, and a new spirit will I put within you, and I will take away the stony heart out of your flesh, and I will give you a heart of flesh. He'll give us a heart, one that's soft and, and pliable under the control of the Holy Spirit. A heart that can bend and flex with life's challenges. A heart that can, can take whatever situation that may come your way and deal with it in the manner that Christ's heart would deal with it. Isn't that a wonderful thought? With kindness and understanding and love and firmness of character and conviction, all of that is a part of it. He's ready and willing to give us a new heart of flesh, one softened by the Spirit of God, a heart that is pliable, a heart that is compassionate. Well, well, let's get back to our story. Bob is truly enjoying his new leaf on, lease on life and truly blessed of God. But one day Bob received a phone call that would forever change his life, even more than what he had already experienced physically. The person on the other end of the line said, is this you, Bob? Yes, is this you, Bob? It is. And the voice on the other end said, hi, Bob, I'm Michael's father. And my family and I are aware that you received Michael's heart after the accident. Complete silence. Bob didn't know what to say. Slowly he got his voice back and he proceeded to tell Michael, Michael's father, how the gift of his son's heart had not only saved his life, but had been an inspiration 
behind his total transformation in his lifestyle because he was so grateful. Then Michael's father made an unusual request. He said, Bob, would it be all right if I were to come and bring along Michael's widow and his brother and sister to pay you a visit? Well, Bob took a deep breath. And then, of course, without hesitation, he said, well, yes, of course. You would be welcome. Please, come. The next day, Bob waited anxiously for their arrival. He was looking out the window. He was looking for the family to drive up. Finally, a car pulled up into the driveway. <clears throat> and Bob watched very intently as the family got out one at a time. The driver, whom he determined was Michael's father, got out of the car. Then a lady out of the other side, whom he deduced was... Um, Michael's widow. And they were followed from out, out of the back doors by his brother and his sister. Bob met them at the door and greeted them warmly. <clears throat> he seated them all in the living room and, and they all sat down. And there were quite a few moments of deafening silence. After getting Acquainted, Bob felt impressed to share with the whole family how drastically and dramatically his life, entire life, had changed. And the family listened intently as Bob shared this experience. And they thanked him for his kindness and allowing him to come and visit with them. Then they prepared to leave. <clears throat> Just as they were going out of the door, Michael's father stopped and turned around and looked tenderly at Bob. And he <clears throat> cleared his throat and he proceeded to ask Bob one more request. He said, Bob, could I place my ear to your chest? And hear my son's heartbeat. One more time. Bob was quite shaken. But he methodically reached down and began to unbutton his shirt. Then he waited while Michael's father reached into his pocket and pulled out a, a stethoscope. He placed his ear pieces into his ears. And he placed the other end on Bob's chest. All was quiet as Michael's father listened to his own son's heartbeat. Then with tears in his eyes, he withdrew the stethoscope, folded it up, placed it in his pocket. He reached up and wrapped his arms around Bob and whispered goodbye. They were gone. I share that story with you. I told you to pray for me, didn't I? <clears throat> Beloved, when God places his ear over your heart and mind. Does he hear his son's heartbeat?
Jeremiah 24 says, verse 6 and 7, I will watch over and care for them, and I will bring them back here again. I will build them up and not tear them down. I will plant them and not uproot them. I will give them hearts that recognize me as the Lord. They will be my people, and I will be their God, for they will return to me wholeheartedly. One of the most intimate moments in life is when you pause to listen to the heartbeat of someone you love. You might be a child lying on your father or your mother's breast, and you can hear that heartbeat. placing your head against the chest of a loved one long enough to hear the rhythm of your life, of their life, rather. Or like when a couple hears or watches the first ultrasound of their baby. Most of us have been there too, haven't we? Everyone you see, everyone you meet has this relentless beating in their chest that circulates that oxygen giving blood flowing to every cell in the body. Does God hear the beat of his son's heart within those chests? God holds you gently against his breast. He loves you so. He wants you close enough to feel the rhythm of his heart and the patterns of his thoughts. He's our creator, and we're his creation. All creation longs for connection with his creator, and we are no different. We're God's creation, and his image desires so to dwell within us. God's heartbeat is for all of his creatures. Just for a moment, listen. Have you ever been able to hear your own heartbeat? Are you paying close attention? When God the Father places his ear over your heart and mind, does he hear his son's heart beating? Let us kneel and pray. <coughs> Oh, Father, may we never listen to another heartbeat the same again as we leave this place today. May we recognize that every beat of our heart needs to be the beating of your son's heart because it has been transplanted in our chest. Because you have to dwell in our heart if we have any hope. That's where you need to be. That's where your son's heart needs to be beating, Lord. And every beat is saying, I love you. Every beat of our heart needs to say to our fellow man, I love you too. So with this, be with us as we separate. Use us in thy service. In Jesus' name.